Interview 2. We've just had a fantastic panel on when to stop world building. And now we're going to get you started again. It's all about geography, guys. And who could be better to talk about that than my fabulous guest of today? Let me welcome to the virtual world building uh, stage the amazing Andy Law and the ever fabulous Kaoric. Beans, how are you doing? Great, thank you. Thanks for having us. <laughs> it is such a pleasure. Andy, just a heads up, you are muted. There we go. Fantastic. There we Andy, go. How are you As doing? I said, marvelously. <laughs> Fantastic. I know that you put your rainbow hat in the wash, especially for this occasion. I am Absolutely. living for it. <laughs> Andy Law, my goodness, how can I introduce him? Award winning cartographer and game designer. Andy Law has worked on many fan favorite settings, including Warhammer, Call of Cthulhu, Taldorai, Game of Thrones, Dragon Age, 40K, and so many more. Andy, welcome to World Building Con. How are you? How are you doing? Uh, as I think I mentioned, marvelously. <laughs> and Kaora is an internationally renowned illustrator and fantasy cartographer who has worked for, among others, the Critical Role franchise. Ah, twinsies. Yeah. Uh, he also holds a degree in game design, is an active tabletop RPG man uh, game master, and a pro D&D streamer. You can learn more about them, their maps, their illustrations, their TTRPG settings, and more at Kaora.com. So, world building geography, we better start because holy moly, is this a big topic. Uh, and let's start at the beginning. Where do you start when it comes to world building geography? Andy, what are your thoughts? Where do we start? Um, <clears throat> should I just settle myself down in and say, um, in the beginning, um, so everybody tackles this particular problem in their own unique way. Um, I've, in my position as a professional doing maps for other people, encountered people let's say creators who have spent a lot of time meticulously creating a very real, pardon me as I bash my mic, um, very developed setting where they've really considered where all the rivers drain out through various basins from various mountain ranges and have considered every single last step of how their world is built. Others have gone, hey, I only need to get my characters over to that town. So yeah, there's stuff. I might mention there's mountains in the background. And each is an entirely valid way of doing your world building. There is no correct way to start. Some prefer to get all those details in place. Some prefer to build it up as their stories themselves are built. There's also a significant difference between people who are, say, for example, creating for a role-playing game, where you often need to create very broadly because anything could happen, or if you're creating it for fiction, where all you really need to worry about is that well, the railroad that your characters are trammeled along through the course of your particular story. And then you need to worry if there's mountains in their sight in the distance or whether there's a big marsh that they're wandering through. But beyond that, what lies beyond can be figured out at a later date. And it means that you don't need to worry too much about exactly what lies beyond the horizon if you don't want to. Although we all know many a world builder who will detail everything right down to exactly how much gold you could shave off a coin and still spend that coin in a particular shop. Everybody has their own, after all, ways of dealing with these things. But for me, personally, if we're just talking about me, where does it begin? It begins with a map, because it always does with me. Uh, I like to ground myself in the setting that I'm starting, and whether that's a map of a town, if we're sticking with just a small, tight focus, whether that's a map of the surrounding area, the province that you're working through. Um, I find that that really helps delineate the edges of the work that you're working on. I have many stories I could tell about that from various projects in the past, but I shall now pass over so that others can step in. <laughs> Absolutely. So for uh, Andy, it starts with a map, be that a, a town map or a continent map or maybe even a world map. Kaora, how about you? Where do you start world building geography? Well, I think that's pretty hard to follow on from, honestly. <laughs> I think I'll, uh, I think I'll just be like, "Well, that's my answer too." No, uh, <laughs> I think, uh, I think this is a pretty broad question, obviously. And it's like, if you're asking somebody who's just sort of starting off in the, like, the world building space or trying to write fiction, or they're approaching this subject from a really sort of you know, beginner standpoint, you know, how do you start map making? How do you start world building? How do you how do you do these things from a beginner standpoint? I think that's really interesting. And I'm going to propose something like right at the beginning. And then I'm going to pick it apart later, hopefully. But for me, like, understanding things about loads of different sub 
different subjects uh, within map making and, and world building, I think is key, you know, yeah. learning geographical sort of how things form, you know, how mountains form or how rivers work or, you know, how to sort of draw things in a way that represents things that have been done traditionally, you know, like how do people draw maps for fiction books, you know, and, you know, those really nice little, you know, representative maps that have come with a lot of you know, books or, or, or more beautiful things, you know, how do you draw them and how do you present them for your own world? And like getting all the research and putting in the work and finding all this stuff out is part of the process when you first begin, you know, you you grab hold of all this, you kind of absorb it all and then you try and copy it. And I think for me, that's one of the key things that you should probably do when you're just starting out. Yeah. <clears throat> Chat has declared you both delightful, just so that you know. And uh, anyway, <laughs> Oh, um, well, thank you. Can, can I add a small point to that? Because <laughs> I completely agree. And I'm going to suggest something to all of you budding world creators out there that is perhaps not the most, let's say, expected route towards getting information. Ditch Wikipedia. Now, Wikipedia <laughs> is a great place to go because it's full of everything, but it's enormously complex about subjects mm. that perhaps you want simplified. So here's my big suggestion for you. If you, for example, are attempting to organize an entire climate system for your world, something that is deeply difficult, buy yourselves a kid's book about it. Mm. Because kid's books are all about summing up all of the big information in small bite-sized chunks. And that are the, primarily the important parts that you need to get into place when you're building your world for the first time. It doesn't go into all the complex, and this is the sort of chemical you'll find doing this, that, and the other inside a volcanic eruption, where all you want to know is how does lava flow? You get to a kid's book, and it's got a lovely, simplified version of literally everything you could need to know sitting in there. In the UK, for example, you get Osborne books. They are pretty much perfect because they give you beautiful 3D representations of absolutely everything. And they sum everything up in generally a paragraph about 50 to 100 words. And you go, oh, ha, ha. you go to Wikipedia. That paragraph of 50 to 100 words will be about 10,000 words. And at the end of it, you're like, well, I know so much. And I need to include all of this in my world <laughs> now. Because if you're a compulsive world builder like me, every single detail has to go in there. So immediately pulling yourself away from that and looking at what's important can make an enormous difference towards making your world feel big, real, and well-researched without having to spend five billion words trying to define something that could be just summarized in about 50 to 100. Uh, I... I... <laughs> Andy Law is on the same wavelength as I am because that's exactly what I was going to pick apart. <laughs> I was say like, yeah, yeah, it's all great information. You should read it. You should learn about it. But at the end of the day, you have to go back to basics and you have to sort of just... And it's interesting that you said going to child, like, you know, children's books and things like that. Because actually, like, and this is maybe going off into a, another tangent that we have a question for later. But I think, honestly, when you're thinking about, you know, map making and world building and you're trying to do something that's maybe not scientific or realistic and you want to do fantasy and you want to like incorporate like myth and magic and all this kind of stuff having that kind of more childlike sense of you know imagination and creation is really really important and um i think sometimes that gets lost a little bit when you're diving yeah. down into the details or the complexity or you're trying to work out weather systems and ocean currents and tectonic plates and all these kind of like amazing real life sort of geological things it can be uh too much most of the time yeah that actually brings me so nicely to my next question which is essentially there's so much to know about geography. It's such a massive mm. subject. And when you're creating your own geography, uh, it's a running joke that if you take a real world map and you you post it in a map making Reddit, somebody's going to say it looks unrealistic, right? So <laughs> yeah. everybody's a critic with geography. You know, so, some, some will give you more leeway than others. But uh, what are the most critical elements or categories of information that we should be learning about, buying children's books about, thinking about when we're creating geography for storytelling. That might be novels, that might be RPGs, whatever. What should we be learning about and thinking about? Do you want to jump in this time? I'll jump in. Oh, hi. Yeah, you can go. <laughs> <laughs> Kara, what are your thoughts? Uh, oh, do you have uh, a, yeah. a list of things where you're like, these are the things that are important to me for creating spaces? Yeah, so it's interesting. I think it depends a lot on what you're creating. If you're if you're approaching a setting, 
if you're approaching trying to create a huge space, there's obviously a lot of information you want to try and include. You want to try and include loads of different biomes, loads of different things that you might be able to pick out, you know, mountains and forests and deserts. And all of these have different ways of being drawn. They have different ways of acting with one another. You know, how like a, a river might run through from a, a mountain to the coast or, you know, from this biome, or how does it run through the, you know, a, a desert environment or how does it create a swamp and all these different things. Like the amount of information that you need for those kinds of things is a lot. But Sometimes if you're doing something a little more, more, I don't know, down to the ground, like for a story where you're starting off in an environment or in a place or a certain location, you may come up with the imagination for it sort of, you know, in passing as you're writing the story, you know, descriptions for the mountains nearby, you know, the tavern that you're in or the, you know, the town or village that you're in and the valley and the river running through it and things like that. And then picking out those specific elements for your map making, you know, when you translate it to a map, you then can focus on those areas. So it's a little bit more finding the things that you want to sort of create very specifically. Yeah. Um, generally speaking, I think that if you're starting out creating a huge setting map, that can kind of be a mistake for a beginner. I always would recommend creating small little maps. I think it's like my running uh, sort of recommended advice for a beginner, you know, like start small, don't start big because you can really focus and you can get something finished quickly and then you can move on and do another thing and you can learn from it and blah, 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 blah. It's great. But I think that for me, that's kind of like, yeah, you really need to learn about the, the specific things that you're kind of focused on, smaller scale to start with, you know, how do you draw mountains? Because you have a mountain in your story. How do you draw a river? Or how do you create the river? Or how does the river work? And then go from there. I love that. I love that. What are your thoughts, Andy, on this one? I have always had this urge when I'm in panels to try and contradict whoever came before me just so that we can get a discussion going. But I find it hard to. It seems like we're largely sitting on the same wavelength. <laughs> I'll, give it a, I'll give it a bit of a go. I um, knew this would be a great panel. What can I say? You guys are both amazing. I, uh, amazing teams. Uh, I recognize uh, the desire to start small, but I think every single role play world builder who is building their world for the first time can't help but go, I have a giant continent. Yeah. They always do it. Um, and whilst I agree that the good advice is to focus down tightly on your story, often it's the world that they want to build because they're building a, a meta story about everything that's occurring in this cataclysmic setting that they are creating because there's always a cataclysm at some point and that immediately goes big picture and almost everybody that starts off with the first maps they can't help it so i agree well simultaneously go regardless it almost makes no difference because everyone's going to head in that direction anyway <laughs> they've got their big story their big thing they're going to tell so they they'll dive it. in at the deep end whether they think it's wise or not mm -hmm. so um i will reiterate my previous piece of information just because i think it is pertinent get a kid's book it covers all the critical elements for the actual basic geography just buy yourself a geography kids book you can look through that and you're off now, the reason I say that is because having some grounding in all the basics for how things form, how different biomes fall into place, doesn't need to be complex information, just the core of how it all occurs. You're then in a position to go, well, I don't like that. I'm going to ignore it and create what suits best for your world. But at least you're doing it from a position of intelligence rather than just making it up as you go along and then later on justifying some of the oddities that you created as rivers start to fan out in odd ways across your setting or rivers start climbing mountains because you forgot that that's all an upland area. It happens. And sometimes it's those happy little accidents that create some of the best locations in your setting. So those little mistakes can sometimes be the best parts of what eventually becomes your world. So whilst that research is super useful and using that research to create something that's realistic is super useful, your setting may ignore all of that anyway, because it may be built in a magical realm where it's completely flat and rivers don't actually make any sense at all. Um, yeah. You know, if you actually thought about it, it's like, how are they going down? Your whole world's flat. Ugh, help. Nothing works. And that's cool because your yeah. setting is magical. But at least you understand how it works in the first place. So you're choosing to do that. And that, I think, is the big step where you're moving from the position of being, say, for example, Picasso, an extraordinary artist who went off in a completely different direction to everybody else. But he had all the key skills behind him already. He understood how art worked. He then created some crazy stuff. And that's awesome. And you can do exactly the same with your 
uh, world building through the geography that you create for your maps, regardless of how you may depict it, whether it's just harsh circles saying that's one mountain range, done. And then a couple of lines passing out of that, rivers, done. That's cool. That's fine. That's not a finished piece of art if you're trying to sell it, but it's absolutely perfect to pass it over to someone like ourselves. And we'd look at it and we'd go, excellent. I'll turn that into something artistic and cool. Also, yeah. your rivers, they appear to be going uphill. And yeah. then the conversations got, I literally have had that conversation. Yeah. <laughs> you're left going, oh. I, uh, I was just I reminded of, yeah. Yeah, I was just reminded of this amazing, um, it kind of like image picture of like a children's book style um, coloring with all the place names for, um, you know, biomes and locations and environments for geography. So it had like cliffs and mountains and canyons and things. And it was one image. And it was just a representation, like a colored image with all these names on it. And I was like, that's almost all you need. Like you oh, could just take helps. that and you could just run with it and use that to create a map. And yeah. Amazing. I love it. All right. So actually that, again, you've, you've very nicely segued onto my next question for me, oh. which is um, when, we're, when we're creating fictional spaces, we're combining a lot of different ideas. We're combining real world geography because we want things to feel authentic and just about understandable. And then we're also combining fantastical elements. We might be combining historical events, like where did this giant scar in the landscape come from? Hmm, interesting, <laughs> right? Like there's, there's all sorts of different <laughs> things that we're, we're bringing together to create fictional spaces where we can tell stories. Mm -hmm. How can you combine all of these elements to create a landscape that feels both real and wondrous or fascinating or deeply terrifying, whatever it is that we're, we're trying, to, trying to achieve here? Okay, I'll jump You're in. Done. <laughs> um, I'll go. Uh, right, so um, if you want to create something that's wondrous, marvelous, magical, mystical as you wander on your mystery tour, it's essential that you have something to contrast it with. If everything is magical, nothing is magical. It's just normal. So it's essential that, for example, your core geography has a certain grounding in reality so that that magical thing stands out and they go, oh, there's a special thing. That's something that stands in contrast to everything else. It's a mistake sometimes for people to try and outdo themselves with each next magical piece of awesome when they're attempting to create a truly magical, truly extraordinary world. They're often better dialing it all back so that those magical things that they're trying to focus on really stand out. And that is where, again, I would recommend you go back to just basic world building get everything in place, make it all make sense in a way that you think works for your world, and then go, right, so here is my gigantic scar on the world. And that gigantic scar was created by this extraordinary event. And then consider the impact of what that will have on the existing setting and what changes it may then make. Because you can move things around. It's your world. You can do whatever you want with it. That's part of the fun. As another small aside to that, also consider the geography you're creating in terms of the natural stories that would form because of the geography you've created. And whether you want that to be the case, mountains make borders. It kind of happens. And because of that, peoples will be separated. And that naturally means if there's resources involved somewhere between these mountains, there will immediately become a story as they individually try and grab these resources. There may be conflict. Um, Conflict is at the heart of pretty much every story. And looking at the various geographical positions and places you've made and going, well, what are they going to eventually fight over? Because they will. This place here has nothing, so they're going to constantly be looking for something. This place over here seems to have everything, so they're going to be consolidating. And they're almost certainly going to be a far more guarded, perhaps richer folk. Think about that and then add your giant scar. Because suddenly, not only do you have the individual conflicts that you've already built basically by the geography alone, but then you have this enormous event that's jumping in and it will carve right through it, create new allies, create new enemies, create potential situations that characters, whether it's role-playing characters or whether it's fictional characters you're taking through your stories, can then engage with and consider the past of what those events appeared to be and then consider the stories that are told about that. Because one of the biggest mistakes I've found with many world builders is that they write a past that is real. Yeah. And they say, this is what happened, rather than start writing a past that is what everyone believes happened. Mm. And then 
importantly, the PCs or your characters encounter it, and then they possibly find the truth as they dive deep into that horrible scar, and it contradicts everything they know. And that is a conflict between the paradigm that everyone expects to live by and this new thing that they've suddenly encountered. And that can create well, religious issues, that can create entirely personal problems. And that is a good conflict as well to potentially mine. Yeah, absolutely. Now, Kaora has actually done with me already a whole uh, podcast on this subject of making <laughs> landscapes feel wondrous. So I know mm -hmm. that we've talked about this in great detail before. Kaora, can you share your thoughts with us on this? I'm going to do that thing that Andy just did with my previous thing and contradict slightly because I, I and don't but, get me wrong, I completely agree with everything, <laughs> except, except I will say that I think there's actually a little bit of a trap sometimes with creating world building and map making from logical, historical or, you know, scientific, you know, processes. Yeah. Sometimes I think that you can create worlds that are purely fantastical, you know, purely wondrous, you know, mountains made of lavender petals and grasses of emotions and things like this, like stuff like that sometimes can lead to really, really cool world building places. Now, it is hard to do without some understanding of basic elements. Like you do have to kind of go through this flow, right? For me, like you kind of have to understand the basics, then you kind of like, maybe you create, you know, some realistic things to sort of really nail it down. But then you need to go the other way and you need to kind of like rip it apart and try and think like a child and try and create stuff that isn't real. And yeah, of course, you can contrast that with some, you know, more realistic elements to give that kind of what I would consider a focal point on a map, you know, a big scar, a massive volcano, Mordor in Middle Earth, you know, these focal points on the map that are different to the sort of more classical, you know, real life representations of the world. But you can also do the extreme. You can go to really, really crazy places and come away with it with really interesting world building and map making sort of creations. I love that approach. I absolutely love it. Andy, any 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 thoughts on that? I agree. <laughs> I know that that's really rather dull to say, but I, I do actually agree. Um, the I opened with the be careful of making everything magical because then everything mad it's not magical. It's normal. That's yeah. cool. Um, if you're creating a world where magic is normal and it's a part and parcel of the entirety of the fantastical creation that you're bringing to life, that is cool and that's mm. fine. But if you're trying to create a world where there is these magical places that everyone is in awe of, that is when you need to very carefully consider your contrast between what they consider to be normal and what they are now encountering. So, yeah, I completely agree with them. Completely. I love completely that. Completely agree with them. Brilliant. You're both so brilliant. I love it. Um, <laughs> so both of you are not just e incredibly experienced and award-winning map makers, but also game designers and storytellers. Mm -hmm. So I have to ask you, how can we use world-building geography, not just to, to make beautiful images of our world, but to make our stories and games more exciting and evocative, to work them into narratives, to, to, to make world-building help us tell our stories? I'll take this one. Uh, <laughs> so for me, I think when you when you really break down games and stories and books and narratives, you kind of have to look, you know, at what's been made before. And you kind of, when you approach these things, you want to create something that's unique or a unique-ish, you know, it's not everything's unique, but you want to create your own thing. And so you need to, like I said before, you need to learn what's come before you. And for me, like when you're playing in a tabletop RPG setting, you know, like Faerun or, or Eberron or some other sort of setting, they have tropes and stereotypes that, you know, you would maybe use or maybe you would want to break. But traditionally, like when you're creating your own project, you might use that as an understanding, like as a base. And then you would go into it and you would think to yourself, hmm, okay, so this is how they did this. This is how they used this. This is how they created this. How am I now going to break this apart and create something of my own? And I think that's when you start to create sort of, okay, well, I want elves, but I don't want elves. So how do I make them feel different? And how do I make their architecture feel different? How do I make the way, like where they live different? These aren't elves that live in forests. These are elves that live in deserts. So what would their places look like? What would the region look like? Because they've lived there for thousands of years. And this starts to create interesting, not just 
you know, world building narrative, but also interesting geography because you're thinking about all these different things that are kind of ripping things apart. So for me, you know, creating something new is all about understanding what came before and then sort of ripping it apart and trying to, you know, create something that's going against that kind of trope or that stereotype, you know, trying to create new when it's not really as new as you think it is, but it is that creative sort of understanding of new. Absolutely. And again, if you want to hear about tropes and subverting tropes, we had a panel on that yesterday. You can find that on the VOD. Yeah. Andy, how about you? How can we make world building geography part of our stories? How can we make it make our, our narratives more exciting? How can we <clears throat> weave it together? I'm, I'm trying to think of a, a good different angle because that's always the best way to approach these things. Right. So I'm going to uh, try and build a slightly different picture. Um, maps are quite unique in terms of illustration. Uh, illustration, particularly in books for covers or for your role-playing books with all your various pictures that you might find through it, are often depicting a single scene, a single moment. And as a reader, mm. they're typically skimmed over. Mm. They're looked at for a few seconds and you move on. Yes. And you move to your next page, you move to your next page. Maps are referenced again yes. and again and again and again. So as someone who's creating a map, You've got to realize that this map is going to be telling much more of a story than almost any other image that you may have. Massively more. Because they're going to look at it. If it's a narrative that they're following, they're going to go, where does the narrative go? If it's a role-playing game, they're wondering where their characters are going and what they're hearing about, about the strange land X that's about to invade. And that means that you've got to, as a creator of the map, make some decisions about what the world is and how it should be depicted upon the map. And that means that you can, for example, have a massively inaccurate map because it's a, an in-game representation of what actually is happening. So rather than it being this God view piece of perfection, it's actually something that has been created in world. It is wrong. It has got lots of mistakes, but you've got to make sure that you mark that. You can have cartographical notes on it. That tells you something about the nature of how maps have been put together. You could have yourself pictures on it or perhaps heraldic devices that have been placed around it. The here be dragons part mm. that may be sitting along the edges, trying to make sure that the world and the storytelling of this map explains that the world itself is sort of unsure. It's sort of uncertain. If you're in a magical world, by comparison, you may have yourself a bunch of wizard or other sorts of sorceress whizzy woos who are capable of accurately charting the entire world because of their magic of whatever it may be. And that presents, again, a very different world. You can go quite detailed with that sort of map, but that doesn't mean that you can't tell stories with the map that you're presenting. Again, somebody has built this map. Something has occurred. Someone has commissioned it. Someone has put it in place. All of these things combined together to be potentially useful pieces of information that you can place on your map. You've got to remember that it's not just about conveying information as in what is where, what hill is where. It's also about explaining the setting to whomever it is that's looking at that map. So unlike your average illustration, which will be skimmed by, your map is going to be looked at a lot. So don't just think of it in terms of where is everything. Think of it in terms of what story am I telling with the images that I'm putting forward to you. I, I tried to angle there. I want to and jump I'm... in quickly, sorry, Janet, and say this is this is I'm going to be really careful not to break any NDAs. We found your virtual tabletop right now. Uh, <laughs> this is an element that I'm working on right now, right? Which is in a digital space, what happens to the world when the world changes as you're playing through a story or a narrative? And so if you're working with digital and you're not, you know, most people these days have the tools or the, you know, the tools are more widely available. Uh, so on a digital map, you can have different versions of that map. And especially mm -hmm. in a game, you can change the map depending on what happens in the narrative. And I think that's fascinating because again, like completely agree with Andy, like you go back to the map, you reference it, you, you try and work out where you are in relation to other things that are happening that have been talked about characters from one place or another place, or, you know, you think, Oh, this, 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 this character's from here. Oh, where's that? And it's just, it just makes your mind go, Brr. but that's one of the things I'm trying to work out on at the moment is how you kind of like, you change the map to suit the narrative, like the map changes. And I think yes. that's, that's amazing. That's a great space to be working in. 
Um, I indeed, love- just one small other comment in this one, because I agree with that completely. And my last comment on it, this is, if you do intend to have an inaccurate map at the core of what you're doing, make sure that that piece of information is introduced relatively early, whether that's through mm. your narrative or whether it's through your game. So the PCs arrive in an area if it's a role-playing game and they find out it doesn't match the map that they have. So that immediately puts them on their toes. Again, telling a different story, the conflict between reality and the story that whoever created the map is attempting to present. Mm-hmm. So with the same question, I actually want to dig into the other side of this, which is something that Andy touched on earlier, which is... Mountains are natural barriers, for example. What happens Mm -hmm. when a river moves, for example? And really, so what other ways can we use the geography that we've built to to help us tell our stories, to have the geography factor in our stories, be part of the conflict or be part of, you know, really the fabric of the narratives that we're telling? What are your thoughts? Uh, Yeah, I'll I'll take it. I think that's a really fascinating thing because obviously like you read a lot of fantasy books and and, and obviously they have a lot of, or most commonly they will have geographical elements that play key roles in the story. I mean, it's unavoidable. You know, things will happen in the story in one place and then because of the actions of the protagonists or the people that are being presented in the story, the geography will change. You know, it's just so common. Typically, though, you don't really have this chance to change the map after the fact. Like, if you have a, a like a map at the beginning of a book, you know, like a, a a huge novel, right, or the first part of a novel, it will be static for that entire novel. You may have a chance to for book two to change the map based on you know the actions of the party. But I think that that kind of thing is something that you should be really aware of when you're writing a narrative, right? Like the path that you take through your world means that you are interacting with the world, like the geography, like everything around you, the forests that you're walking through, if they're infested with giant spiders and they kill the threat of the giant spiders or they eliminate that threat, how does that change the geography for the next part of the book? You know, how does that change the environment? And and some books and some narratives and some places, some people really dig into that and, and really try and like make that a, a massive part of like a, a living world. Um, and I love that. Uh, but it can be something that you just have to, you know, recognize as you're, you know, weaving your, 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 your you know, your narrative. Yeah, absolutely. Andy, All right. What are your thoughts? Um, let's see if I can take a completely different angle again. Um, <laughs> Marvel superheroes. Um, mm. One of the big issues that I have with, it's not just Marvel, it's DC as well, with superheroes is that they have all these marvelous powers. And you have a little think about it and you go, well, if I had all these marvelous powers, this could happen. But you see them all meet up and they're all sort of brought to a similar keel so that they can all yeah. impact the narrative in a similar fashion. Um, a classic example being anything where lots of superheroes get together. Um, Batman is rubbish. He, you know, he is, in comparison to everyone else. He just is. And somewhat similarly, um, one of the big issues I have with maps is looking at the maps and going, well, there's a big forest there. There's mountains over here. There's marshes over here. We immediately create geopolitical divisions because of where all the natural resources are going to naturally fall, because of where the rivers are moving and the natural borders will fall into place. And then you look at the narratives and you're like, well, our countries make no sense. Because they haven't thought about how the very nature of geography defines politics, whether it's an Mm. island. If you're on an island, you are almost certainly going to be able to spread out towards the edges of that and control it, creating an island nation. Um, And that then often becomes uh, almost hand in hand with a certain warlike attitude as you now control everything that lies up to your borders. And that often turns into, I'm now going to progress outwards. And you'll find that in many both historical and also fantasy novels where island nations are often depicted as imperialistic British alikes, where they're going to go out and they're going to kick everybody in. Um, But you should consider that. And loosely speaking, there's only so many features on a map normally beyond the cool, crazy stuff that we add. You've got your forests, you've got your mountains, you've got your marshes and your rivers and your open plains, and you've got your islands and you've got the natural deposits of resources that will be there. And you can add jungles and deserts and all the rest of it. And you're going to expand outwards, depending on which direction you go, what sort of biomes you're interested in. 
but every single last one of them comes hand in hand with some basic core information. And that is somebody controls it or nobody controls it. So possibly there's an incoming fight, particularly if it's in the middle of a, like a, a forested area that used to be populated. But regardless, someone probably controls it. There's natural resources. They're going to want them. Consider that when you're doing your world building. Um, that means our rivers are going to naturally be a point where people can look at each other and often form borders. Equally speaking, our mountains often form borders. Big open spaces often form into uh, looser tribal folks, arguably, until eventually they can meet the technological level to significantly grab and control an area. But you'll tend to find that they will build up lots of individual settlements spread out with ill-defined borders between them. On our map, they may look really well def defined, but in reality, it's just a, it's sort of between those two towns. Have we reached their point? It's wherever they're going to send out their armies or their equivalent little sets of foraging troops or whatever it may be. Where do they butt heads? Where does the border naturally form? And just look and you'll find them at rivers. So reflecting that in your nation building, in the stories that you're building for individual characters, in the stories you're building for individual realms and how they build is pretty much not just a necessity, it's a, an important part of your world building if you want it to feel believable. Absolutely. We did a whole challenge called Rivers and Waterways at some point. Um, and we have a podcast episode literally about this coming up, which is about waterways and how they can be like gateways to places, but also mm -hmm. barriers to places. Mm -hmm. And that kind of like dual form, dual form sort of uh, role that they play within the real world and within world building. Absolutely. I wanted to, I, wanted, I just had an idea, right? And this is Bring maybe... It too crazy for it, it's going to be a lot of work but i rarely see there's always a cataclysm as andy said yeah. earlier there's always a cataclysm in a world and typically a cataclysm is one of those things that changes the world dramatically but most of the time a cataclysm happens in history and this is kind of like not exactly a cop out, not exactly something that people do because like, oh, you know, we're just doing it. It's really fun and great. I love cataclysms, but they do it so that there's not really like a, a sudden change to the narrative because obviously it's a big deal. I would really like to see and I, I haven't seen these a lot or I can't give many examples of this of like two different maps because this narrative takes place in the middle of a cataclysm. Like you have one map. <laughs> and then the narrative is like the cataclysm happens and then the map changes because it's a lot of work is obviously two different totally different maps and the world is going to go Woo! but that kind of thing <laughs> is like how you change everything you know you would you would have to look at the world building look at the geography look at everything look at the what the cataclysm is and then boom everything is just like different and i think that would be a really fascinating take on that question it's not certainly fun to play in yeah yeah all right my final question and then i have to get to the audience questions there are very many of them okay. describing the impossible is a real challenge for gms for writers and yet we have to mm. convey impossible geography impossible spaces to our players and readers do you have any tips for conveying fantasy geography through words as opposed to images through words did you say yeah Oh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, so uh, you're asking me to uh, say how, how I use words rather than how maps. can exactly? So rather than just drawing it on a map, how can you describe this sort of fantasy geography in a way to help the person on the other end understand what it is that you're talking about? Because in right. a novel, for example, you can't have an illustration for every single spectacular scene that you you mm, visit, absolutely. but you still need to convey that. Um, so then if we're going down to the bare brass tacks, um, the very first thing to consider is uh, sensation. Um, sensation is a really good place to begin. And the obvious one is what does it look like? But you also have what does it sound like? What does it feel like? What does it smell like? How exactly um, is someone interacting with this going to feel the change? Because if it's fantastical, it's not normal. If it's yeah. something that goes beyond the, the pale, so to speak, it's well beyond what we accept as a normal thing, non-Euclidean, for example. Trying to convey that uneasiness or that magical mystery is uh, a core component of what your words have to say. And often, if you're, for example, writing a role play book, you've got a much easier job on that because you can simply state it as what it is. It's a weird alien thing in it. 
but perhaps said a little bit more eloquently. Because you can, in a role play book, describe things as they actually are, where when you're writing a narrative, you've got to be far more aware of the individual who's experiencing that narrative, perhaps it's a perspective piece, which means that you're going to have to then go very much into what do they experience, which is why I go back to sensation immediately. Um, when I'm uh, building up anything that is a little bitty out there, my first thought is, um, how is it going to be experienced by the people who are encountering it? And I'd say that that is my first place to go. Yeah, I love that. I love that. Kara, what are your thoughts on this? Same. <laughs> I mean, I can only really, I can only, <laughs> well, what do I say? Like, that's that's the kind of the same thing. But I would say that, and this is, this is just a real cop-out because this is the title of the talk, but dial it down to the myth and magic of your world. What mm. is the magic system? Like, what is the magic in your world? There's loads of different kinds of, like, you know, systems and ways of presenting, you know, fantastical storytelling, you know, classical or high fantasy or dark fantasy and all of these different things. Like, what is it that makes your world fantastical? And then you realize that the descriptions and the things that you're going to be describing in your world can be pulled from other areas of that that you know about. You know, if you're writing a dark fantasy setting, you know, figure out all those dark you know, horrible things that you want to write about, you know, the grim and the dark and the, and all of that stuff to then describe these locations. And, you know, for me, when I'm you know, not just writing, but also map making, and this is combined, you know, you're thinking about scale and color and all these, you know, things to make it bigger than life or, you know, more impressive or, you know, fantastical. But when you're describing it, it has to be tied for me into your sort of your history, your myths, your legends, but also kind of like, your theme and your genre and your like what makes your world your world um that's what all i was like good meta stuff yeah meta <laughs> uh it's no secret that um both uh andy and kara are world envelopes uh using world anvil uh and the world building meta is a thing that can probably help you with that to kind of really dig down into the what you're trying to build mm -hmm. so you can then make the geography do the thing <laughs> Because at the end of the yeah, day, do the it, thing. <laughs> at the end of the day, the geography, it's a tool, right? It's a, it's, mm. it's just one of the things that we're using to tell amazing stories in amazing spaces. Mm -hmm. I think that brings us to our audience questions. And here's the first one. Can you well build geography without a map? Yes. 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 Right. Good. Moving on. <laughs> <laughs> do you want us to elaborate? <laughs> sure. <laughs> Well, of course you can. Yes, you can world build geography because you're writing a space. You know, you're writing a world. Yeah. Yes. yes. Absolutely. Uh, for me, so these two are map makers, right? They make beautiful maps, which means both of them have said when they start, they start with a map or they start with a mm -hmm. concept and then the map comes pretty quickly. I am also a professional world builder. I write books. I've worked on game series. I don't start with a map. I start with ideas. Sometimes I start with a basic visualization with circles. For me, the map comes when I can't manage the world building without the map anymore. When it's got to the point where I don't know how far away something is and it's relevant to a plot. When it's got to the point where I'm not sure, I, I want to talk something about resources, but I'm not sure what's near the thing that I'm talking about. Then I, I make a map. My maps are really ugly. They're not for other people. It's what, uh, what Andy was saying before. My maps are hella ugly i made my first map in microsoft paint it was so right. pixelated and gorgeous <laughs> but it did it did the job for me for maps yeah. don't just have to be beautiful and inspiration they can be utilitarian so i would say yes absolutely you can world build geography without a map just uh remember that there may be a point where you need to write things down and you write them down as pictures is what i would say agreed completely um mm -hmm. for all i said <laughs> earlier that um, i started with a map i i tend to write like mad first I am actually entirely honest with myself um, because I need to nail down core themes, core uh, core everything. Um, and before I know what it is that I'm building, I can't really do that. Um, although I do have some examples where that's not the case. But let's yeah. carry on with our questions. I love this. So I, again, another like that. That's all meta stuff. We're starting yeah. with a meta, guys. Eventually, everyone starts with a meta. <laughs> All right, a great question here from Zimkster, who says, Hello. how do you find a balance with detail? When is too much and when is too little? I'll jump on this one first, um, because uh, uh, this is a really deeply personal point. 
um, because everybody really does have their own tolerances and limits. And I'm going to use a, a specific example for this one. Um, Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay is a game that is renowned for having a big, long pass with maps that deeply contradict each other again and again and again and again. Um, because different people have come in and they've rewritten it in a slightly different way without referencing what came before. And we ended up with, let's say, a melange of a setting. And uh, in that, there is a wide player base, some of whom adore that and don't like maps with detail because they like to fill in their own details as they go. And there are writers that like the same thing. They just want big picture stuff so they can, when they're doing the fine detail, fill that in as they go. They don't like all the detail. But there are other games masters out there who want everything there. They want to know what will happen when they go from A to B and every single important detail that exists between there and there. They want the detail. And they can never have enough detail. I could probably map Warhammer for the next 2,000 years and they still wouldn't be happy because they want that extra little shrine that might be sitting on the roadside or that extra little detail of a herdstone that's hiding behind those trees. So how do you balance the detail? It's a personal thing, I would suggest. Um, in general, I would argue that as much detail as you like, but if you find that you're spending all your time world building and you're not actually using it for whatever you're world building it for, then perhaps you have a little bit too much detail. But that's down to individual preference. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Kara, what are your thoughts on this? Oh, no thoughts. That's all right. Kara, next no question. That's, it. <laughs> that's correct. <laughs> that's just, that's, yeah, it's personal. I have to get you both around for tea at some point. This is too much fun. <laughs> like, I can't even, you don't even live that far away from each other. We can make this happen. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. in the grand scheme of things. All right. We have a mappy, mappy question here. It's only mm. appropriate. Do you have suggestions for varying the shapes of stony forms, mountains, stalactites, cave walls, in an environment that has loads of them? Not everything can be a spire. Yeah, I, I'll take that. I think um, I think you have to kind of learn a lot about the artistic nature of drawing before you can really nail that down. Because when you think about like the descriptive of a mountain, the descriptive of this is typically seen as one thing. But then when you think about it, and when you think about, hmm, actually, it isn't that thing, or I want it to be more interesting, or I want it to be more fantastical, it's like, how do you change that? And the only way you can really do that is understand different shapes and forms and, and look at references and look at the mountains in, you know, southern China compared to, you know, the Himalayas or the Andes or the Slate Mountains of the Rockies, you know, like, these things are like, completely different from a from a shape perspective or when you draw them and the, the way that you draw rocks so what you're really asking is how do i draw and that is all about <laughs> it's all about like learning reference like drawing references and, and different shapes and, and and all that kind of stuff it's like a it's like a process i think that that is a not a tough thing to do but that's like a practice thing you know you need to just slowly build up your repertoire of knowledge on how to draw those different things definitely yeah. and all of the artists that i've seen uh live streaming i've seen they have a map and then they have references directly on the map as they yeah. are drawing that they just overlay uh not andy not andy but many <laughs> other <laughs> so they'll have they'll have sort of relevant images for the thing they're working on mm. like right there as a layer on photoshop that they can you know move them around and, and put them in the right places i've seen many map makers work like this oh, no. i do that with color a lot i do that with color so that i have yeah. like different color palettes for different you know, yeah. biomes and things. I think that's quite useful. Amazing. Yeah, I'm, uh, on this one, I'm about to do a bunch of tutorials online, actually. I'm, I'm sort of about this, but I'm going to be doing seven different ways to show mountains because yeah. I was asked to. Um, because there are so many ways you can do it. But the question is specifically about how do you do um, uh, all on one piece? So it's not about different styles. It's about keeping everything into one style. Um, mm -hmm. And that is, I'm going to be a, a, a bit blunt, actually hard. Mm. It, this isn't the easy part. If you've got a map that is full of the same detail, making that interesting is a challenge. Now, mountains are relatively easy because then you have valleys and you have trees and you have things sitting in between them. But if you've got a blasted mountainous wasteland, then you're going to be looking at other details to try and characterize that place, whether it is interesting location markers, whether it is in-game setting scrolls that have a little bit of text. Um, to try and vary things up. But I, I can't agree with what was said down here more. It's going to involve harder drawing. Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah, absolutely. Draftsmanship. 
Well, yeah. folks, we have one minute left. This panel has gone so mm. very quickly. I have had an absolute blast with both of you. Andy, in 30 seconds, who are you and where can we find you? Ah, I'm Andy. Ah, um, oh okay, God. sorry, pardon me. <laughs> ah, on the spot. Uh, uh, so I'm CEO of Rookery Publications. We create um, uh, role-playing games and uh, board games and stuff. We're just about to get our first one released from Modiphius. I also stream every single week um, where I have guests from across the games industry, and Kira is very welcome, <laughs> hint, hint, hint. Um, where we have guests every single week and we discuss uh, gaming stuff. Um, it's, it's lots of fun. Um, but beyond that, I'm also about to start my own actual play online doing Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay since I designed the most recent version of the game. And I am slightly terrified by this, but it is happening. It's going to be amazing. I'm so excited. You can follow Andy if you're over on Twitch. It'll be easy to find them. Uh, him. He's uh, Rookery Publications on Twitch. Rookery Publications. Uh, yeah, go check out. And Kiara, who are you and where can we find you? <laughs> <laughs> I've got to stop doing no. this to my guests, uh, apparently. Hi, hi. Uh, yeah, I'm Kaora. I, uh, I have uh, just kaora.com. Go to Kaora Patreon. Find all my stuff. I create a lot of map making assets. I'm doing a fascinating bunch of world map and region map assets for Project Deus that are coming out every month. So you can grab those. Some really interesting stuff. Last month's was Lost Civilizations with dinosaurs and tribal things and all these cool Ice Age creatures that you can place on your map. Um, yeah, I know. <laughs> Janet's like, dinosaurs? Um, <laughs> yeah, I'm also the lead designer at Foundry Virtual Tabletop, so that's my other part of my time. And uh, working on some stuff there that you might find really interesting. Um, and if you want to ask me any questions or you want to hang out and ask more detailed world-building questions, come and join my public Discord and you can chat. I'll come and say hi. Yay! Um, we have a public Discord as well. We can say hi to each other. It'll be like... Yeah! <laughs> Join each other! <laughs> I feel like this is the start of something beautiful. And I am here for it. <laughs> Folks, that is all we have time for for this panel. Andy and Kira, thank you both so, so very much. We will be back in ooh, eight minutes with our next event. That is Gail Carriget talking about the heroine's journey, a plotting type that you certainly will recognize, particularly if you play RPGs. It's all about that group cast, making people feel good. It's a fantastic thing that you probably, as I say, are familiar with, but haven't been able to put into words. So I'm very, very excited about that, guys. I'll see you very, very shortly. In the meantime, you know what to do. Grab your hammer and go world build. <laughs>